five years and still talking, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Welcome, this is The Ramble, and I am Alex Bennett, your humble and obedient host. I will be here until midnight tonight, Eastern Daylight Time. We'll have our citizens panel in just about 30 minutes from right now. But uh, we're going to go out to the other coast of the United States, and we're going to talk to one of our favorite people, and he's got a cat. Ladies and, oh, oh, ladies and gentlemen, there's our guest for tonight. Which one is that? Eloise? Heloise? Eloise, very oh, good. Eloise, I'm getting good at uh, recognizing your cat. My cats, yes. Yeah, yeah. She just wants to keep her tail in the picture, that's all. And the t they have more tail. <laughs> they always know when something's, uh, you know, facing them, right? You know, when the camera's on. She yeah. does know when the camera's on. Yeah. How you doing today, Will Durst? I'm good. How's it going, Alex Bennett? Uh, I've been going through a little uh, sicky thing. It, I think it's a, a. I went to the doctor. He thinks it's a pollen. Pollen? Yeah, it's like affecting my throat, and you know, I have a little oh. slight feel like I have to cough. And <laughs> yeah. keep the windows closed. They always know I, when some. I can't do that. You know why? Because my wife. She doesn't want to do that. You know. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I uh, you know, I've, I've got. She likes to have the windows open, and I've been told if it's pollen season and you want to keep the pollen out, keep the windows fucking closed. But she that that that, that yeah, yeah yeah. So she doesn't care if I'm wheezing, if I'm dizzy, if I'm if I've got all this stuff. Like I went to the doctor. I. Uh, Went to the doctor yesterday. Uh, I went to one of these clinics, you know, one of these walk-in places the other day, uh -huh. and he tested me out, and he, he checked my heart, did an EKG, and found that there was an, something wrong with it. Well, there always is something wrong with my EKG because I have a, a bundle or something. that I have a slight some murmur. Sort of, I was, some sort of arrhythmia? A, no, arrhythmia? It, no, no, it's, it's a heart murmur, okay? It's okay. a... Uh, Steno aortic stenosis but so I went to my my other doctor yesterday and um, he's a cardiologist and he gave me an echocardiogram and said hey your, you know your aorta is a little more clogged but not you know he says if it keeps going at this rate you'll be dead of something else before and I said do you have to say that do you have to say I'll be dead he said I know it's a little morbid but you're not going to die from this aortic stenosis so he said, I can't find anything wrong with you, so it's probably the allergies. It's probably the pollen. Because supposedly pollen is just running rampant this year. Just horrible. Do you have air conditioning? Yes. I don't care unless I have the air conditioner on all the time, which isn't necessary. She wants the window open. I well... Uh, I, I'm going to have an obvious answer. I think a divorce. Is, an obvious I, I think a divorce so. is the answer. You know, yes, of course, there's an obvious answer to all of this. At least it will minimize it. You know, but the pollen just keeps wafting into the house. You know, so can you make her a deal like a week on and a week off? Uh, no, no. It, 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 in this house, it's her way or the highway. Hey. I, you know, everything has to be done just right. The bed has to be made in a certain way. You know, I mean, quite frankly, when I wasn't married, I never made the bed. <laughs> you know, I would straighten it. I would straighten it a little bit. If and if it, uh, if I got too much food on the sheets, I'd change them. You yeah. and Marilyn Monroe, apparently. Well, I used to, I used to eat on the bed. I used to literally. I had a. Uh, this was in New York. I had a uh, tarp. I would throw down on top of the bed, and we'd sit there and eat on the bed. <clears throat> I didn't have a dining room table. And then you would hose the top tarp off. If it got bad, we'd hose the tarp off. Yeah, and then you know. 
And plus, it was it was it was uh, uh, convenient because usually I was having dinner with a date, and uh, you know there was very little places we had to go after dinner, but right under the sheets. So you know it was really cut down to the commute. When they came over, I would make the bed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the tarp. And the and the, and and I'd wash the tarp in there on. Yeah. If my wife is listening right now, she's probably going apoplectic, okay? <laughs> because uh, 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 the whole idea of eating in bed, that's another thing. Of her. Don't eat in bed. You're going to get crumbs in the bed. I don't yeah. care. I'll vacuum the bed. That's what I used to do. <laughs> you know? When's the last time you ever vacuumed the bed? Vacuum well, the we bed. Have, we have popcorn in bed, and I'm always ha I always have to get out the towel and wipe the salt out of the bed. Well, we have one of those hand vacs, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That used to do it for me. Never had this problem with other wives. Just this one, <laughs> you know. And of course, yeah, they get set in their ways down the line. Also, you know what's interesting is I had asthma as a kid, and it seems like it's back again. Actually, somewhat not. Not actual asthma, but the you know being allergic to stuff. Uh, for a while, when I uh, when I moved to New York years ago, I lost all those allergies, and then when I went back to California, I didn't seem to have them. Oh. And then I came back to New York, and now I seem to be getting these allergies again. So oh. you know what the hell? A B B A. Yeah. So much about my health. How's your health? Uh, knock on wood. Not good for Micah. Everything's good so far. Yeah. Uh, I get tired faster, but... Uh, I'm tired all the time. What do you mean? I, I could always, as long as I can do in nine, stand up and do a 90-minute show, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. But if I know I'm going to do a show that night... Yeah, you have to get a nap. I can't go to the museum during the day. Oh, I see. Okay. You can't do anything that takes energy. I, I, museums are are what lose out. Well, you're yeah. you're how old now? You're nine, uh, 95, something like that. What? How old something are you? Like that. Yeah, 95 minus 20, 28. You're too, <laughs> no, you're you're 65 or something like that. Around 67, there. yeah. 67. And you're 70. Yeah, I'm 79. So you can only imagine how tired. I, older than I you am, can imagine yeah. how tired I get. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Do you take a nap every day. No. But then I do the show at night, and I do coffee, and about an hour in, it used to be I could do the two hours standing on my head, and now a half, with an hour in, I'm, I'm starting to get dr drowsy. So, you know. Hey, but you can sleep at night after drinking coffee? Uh, yeah, because I get drowsy. <laughs> no, sometimes I have to take something like a Xanax or a... Uh, 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 it, lately, I've decided I'll take Benadryl. That that puts me to sleep, you know. No idea what any of those are. A Benadryl is a decongestant uh, antihistamine. Oh, ah. and the, oh, and antihistamines are good because they're not going to kill you. You could, you know, you just maybe you just dry up and turn into powder. I don't know, you know. Never oh, figured. dry up. Yeah, dry up. Yeah. So anyway, so how's how's business? Uh, you, he's a comic and he does. Uh, Comedy stuff. I do the uh, the yeah. funny comedy humor thing, yeah. and uh, get a gig. Uh, had a gig on Sunday and Father's Day. Not mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote all this new material, and I want to unveil it at the punchline. I'm going to be at the punchline a week from tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, I'm busy rehearsing it, and I go off and uh, and I. This, this is my new set right here. Yeah. And it's only four pages. And I got most of it out on Sunday. And th uh, I got a gig Thursday and Friday. So hopefully I can. Yeah. Well, so well, that's, it, it, that's every, the hard part. Every it's comedian, it's, it's interesting. Every comedian works differently. You write it all out, right? Yeah. I need a script. You have a script. Uh, other comedians have the jokes, they know what they are, and then they just go up and start doing the act. Um, there, there are some who never write them down. No. You know? Um, Those guys have funny bones. I don't have funny well, bones. I don't I'm know. a writer I mean, who performs. Slayton has funny bones, but I've seen him with his notes. You know? 
He, uh, I, I, because I think it has something to do, doesn't it have something to do with remembering the joke, too? That if you just made it up and said, I'll put that in the act, and you didn't write it down, you'd forget it? Everybody's different, as you say. I, I am very dependent on uh, the words. Yeah. Well, your, your whole, f- whole show is precise about words and the order in which they come and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So you work on the punchline. The punchline's closing down, right? Man, it's such a, uh, a mish. Uh, yeah, we don't. We have no idea what uh, uh, because we've heard different things. First, we heard that the landlord, which is Morgan Stanley, mm-hmm. owns the building. The landlord was going to sell that building and the building next to it, which used to be the old Waldorf, going to sell that and the Alcoa building which is across the, that the whole thing was going to be sold to Google. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. uh, we had this huge NATO Green put together uh, a protest and City Steps and Aaron Peskin and Dave Chappelle came down to give it some publicity. Mm-hmm. And then Google was reached by one of the TV stations and said, we are looking forward to having the punchline as our neighbor. So then it kind of seemed that Morgan Stanley was using Google as a Judas goat so that they didn't have to take the weight. And because everybody in town here is so used to blaming Google for everything. Right. You know, just fit another thing. And and so then Google uh, the rumor kind of said, the no, rumor, it's not the, us. The rumor and running Morgan around. Stanley uh, shut up, won't talk to anybody. And Punchline still, and Aaron Peskin put through uh, a temporary zoning restriction so that space of the Punchline can only be used for entertainment. Wow. So we have no idea what Morgan Stanley or Google, we have no idea. Yeah. I'll find out next week. Well, the rumor running around was that Google wanted to turn it into a gym for their uh, for their people. You heard that one, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So it may not it may not close down then. And, uh, we don't know. And the in case we're talking people, about the it, let's, beginning of August or the end of August. Yeah. All I know is August was mentioned. Let's tell people about the punchline. It's a club that's been there for how many years now? Since I think before, 1978, I think 41. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, 41 years. 1978. I got yeah. to San Francisco in uh, late 79 came back to San Francisco, late 79. So it was in operation when I was there, you know. So, uh, and... uh, And It's the perfect size, you know. It's it's a perfect It's 140, I think, after the fire restrictions. It used to be 160, 180, but they had to take the seats along that one wall there by the front door. Yeah. Because the fire marshals came in. It's perfect because it's... the floor is parquet. And the walls are all brick, real brick, not yeah. phony brick, but real brick. Yeah. And then they got this beautiful mural in front. But the laughs bounce off that parquet and off the brick. And the audiences think they're having a much better time than they actually are. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah when, you, when you talk was, about, about brick walls, uh, comedy clubs, by law, have to have a brick wall. No, it uh, works out acoustically. No, no, but what I'm, no, here's what I'm saying. It seems as though every club, even if it isn't a real brick wall, has a phony brick wall. Yeah, yeah, the it does. Club. In fact... And there was a reason for it, and then they started putting up these plastic replicas. Well, no, here's walls. what happened. In, used, in uh, Florida, when I was down in Florida, there was this comedy promoter who did comedy at various venues around town during the week, and he literally had a portable brick wall that went to each of the clubs. So here we are in front of our brick wall doing comedy. Yeah, it became a signifier. It's I think like, uh, I, I think that was the uh, who was it? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, what's the club? The big club that was in New York and then went to L.A. Catch Rising Star? Huh? No, the other one. Uh, improv. Improv. I think because the improv on A and E did their shows and there was a brick wall there. Everybody felt they had to have a brick wall. That's well, my, I think that's the my brick theory. wall started earlier. Yeah, yeah. 
than the improv. Yeah. But anyway, the the punchline is a is a very perfect intimate club. Yeah, it's a civic jewel. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and it's it's continued to make money. It's not going broke, right? I don't know. All I know is that I make uh, the same amount of money headlining as I did my first week there of headlining, which was nineteen eighty. When did I win the comedy competition? 83, 84. I don't Anyhow, know. I got a headlining week after I won the comedy competition. And I'm, I'm making, so 34 years later, I'm still making the same money. Well, they're probably, technically, they're paying less. Oh, yeah, because the door, you know, went up from 10 bucks, if it was 10 bucks, and now it's like 25 yeah, but you know most of those clubs don't actually charge at the door because they have these twofers they hand right. out around town, so that people c- come into the club. It's like you know you get uh, two two tickets, come on in for free. Now here are the drinks; they're forty bucks a piece. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, and Gold Star and Groupon and yeah, yeah. Marketing so, is totally different. Yeah, these days. yeah. But uh, you know, I, it, it it would be sad if the punchline went away only because <coughs> it, it just represents something. It, it yeah, and know. they've had an open mic every Sunday since 1979. Every Sunday, and open night mics, folks, are important. Are important because that's where new comics go in yeah. and can learn how to be a comic. Actually, you know, have an audience that tells them you're not funny yet. You know. And then one night you go in and you get some laughs and you go, I'm finally funny. Yeah, yeah it used to be when I got here, you were an open micer. Yeah. You were uh, uh, an op- an MC. Mm-hmm. Then you were a middle act. Then you were a headliner. Then you moved to L.A. And that was the natural progression, which usually took two, two and a half years to yeah. get through from initially starting out in the city. Yeah, but you, 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 San Francisco yeah. was a way station. It wasn't a destination. You know what the problem uh, to me always was with that hierarchy was that some people were able to jump it. And here's how they did it. If you were a certain kind of act, nobody wanted to follow you. Nobody wanted to follow uh, an act with props. Bobcat. Yeah. Nobody wanted to follow somebody who screams. Okay. Uh, and so, consequently, like something like Bob Goldthwait, he went straight to headliner. You know, where if he wasn't a screamer, he probably would have had to work his way up. Yeah, but he also came kind of fully formed from Boston. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like he had, you know, I came from Milwaukee. I wasn't getting the same kind of uh, no uh, repetition on stage that other people were getting in other cities. Chicago, you could get up every day, yeah. every night. Boston, you could get up every night. You know, I still don't understand why he went to San Francisco instead of New York. Who? Bobcat. Well, Bobcat. Uh, I, I don't think New York, oddly enough, wasn't a jumping off point. It wasn't a point at which you could build a reputation. It's where you went once you had one. You know? It's, I the think two you're right, cities, yeah. The two cities that were engendering... The, that embracing that kind of growth that you have to have in order to be a, a, a comic were Boston, which was a hotbed of comedy and so on. Especially if you were a white male. Gave, gave us the likes of Bobcat and Kev, Kevin Meany, and I'm trying to remember all the other people. Dana Gould. Dana Gould. Uh, Paula Poundstone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, um, then you would, you know, San Francisco was the other city. That was good this way. So if you were in Boston and you wanted to go somewhere else, you came to San Francisco. You didn't go to L.A. L.A. was where you went after you made it in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, and the only reason you went to L.A. is you wanted to be seen on stage so that maybe some TV network would see you and give you a sitcom and then you never have to go on stage again. (laughs) Really, that's what it's all about. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and and people who did not like stand up. They just used it as a as a conveyor belt to the big time. The biggest right. road warrior I know, which is Bobby Slayton, okay, who's out on the road a lot, okay, and through his life has probably logged up more air miles than anybody I know, okay. Uh, he went to L.A. and uh, he would have been very happy to get a sitcom and not have to go and do his act anymore. You know, it's just that way. 
Now, the only guy I know who hated doing a sitcom and was happy when it was over and went back to doing comedy in clubs and on stages across the country is Seinfeld. And you can't think of a more successful guy in television. No. You know, but he didn't like it. He didn't like the pressure. He didn't, you know, he talks about it all the time that he was, when it was over, he was happy. You know, he was also about a half a billion dollars richer, but he was happy. I don't know. I just saw What, hap I what saw happens when you get to be that rich? Uh, a lot of different pressures. Well, you can say fuck you to a lot of people. That's true. <laughs> you know. Uh, the, f the thing was, I saw a documentary on the last, uh, on the how Seinfeld came to be and all the stuff they had to go through. And, uh, and Dave, uh, they tell about Larry David, and Larry David on the documentary admits to it that he didn't want to work that show. He thought he would do the pilot, and that would be it, it would fail, and then he could go back to whatever he was doing. You know, he didn't want to have to do that, um, that whole thing. Uh, it says here I'm getting a poor connection. Well, you're coming through okay. Anyway, uh, 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 that he didn't want it. He didn't want it. And they finally, they, they said to him, well, look, we're going to do four more. Come back and do it. And we'll make you an executive producer. <laughs> they threw him executive producer. And now he's, of course, worth, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars. He only has, he doesn't have a half a billion dollars because his wife took half of it. You know, <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, if if Larry David had had his way, he never <laughs> would have had that success. You know, no, it, the show would not have been a success. Well, it it took the two. They needed all those voices in there to keep that show. Yeah, uh, to be so unique. You know, well, it took the it took the two of them. Uh, in, in, in they just said they were a perfect confluence of of uh, energy. You know, and that what they're there and they stood by their idea of what the show should be, you know, and not that it was a show about nothing, but that it, it just was not about what other sitcoms are about. You know, there wasn't the one. No, it was about minor irritations and and stuff that, you know, a whole day can turn around and everywhere that we've been. And, you know, you, we've, you we've to, all, yeah, you, you go to a Chinese restaurant. That's an episode, yeah. you know. Uh, and and they stood. And they didn't have to have a moral at the end. It, well, yeah, they stood true to their vision, and their vision worked. You know, and, and in the last episode, everybody goes to jail. It, yeah, and I don't think anybody's ever done that kind of show since. I think that was uh, one of a kind. Uh, they've tried to do things like it. You know, I always considered Friends the poor man Seinfeld, but it never was. It was Friends. It was a bunch of friends that hung out. So it was Seinfeld. But the difference was some of them were likable on Friends. On Seinfeld, there wasn't one person there who wasn't selfish and self-absorbed. Well, you, know? you were talking about uh, a comedian and his circle of friends, you know. Yeah. So they're, they're smart. And I, I never knew what Friends was about. It was about trying Except to... Except they had a great apartment. Yeah, I never watched the show. I watched one episode or tried to watch one episode and I went, eh, this is a poor man Seinfeld, you know? And I, so I, I, I had no great love for it. I don't watch a lot of sitcoms because I feel betrayed by the laugh track. It's like them telling you when to laugh, and I hardly well, ever agree with their I, I, This is something I argue or, with girlfriend about. Or their vociferous. This is something I argue with girlfriend about. She says she doesn't like laugh tracks. And I said, well, you know, I said, you should, you should watch Big Bang Theory. And she says, well, I don't like laugh tracks. And I said, that isn't a laugh track. That's an actual live studio audience. Because they feel, and uh, uh, Chuck Glory always felt that having a live audience and not all the shows have a live audience now but uh, having a live audience keeps your comedy honest you know when it's funny when there's an audience you don't know when it's funny when you've written it and somebody does it and you say good performance we hope people laugh at that <coughs> you know so yeah, i don't i don't I, I still don't like the the studio laughs then if even if it's not a laugh track i don't like i just don't like it it makes me crawl yeah because 
I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to a lot of time trying to elicit actual laughter, and I know the difference. Yeah, well, I just don't like it when it's uh, when it's pre-recorded laughter. You know, in the old days, if somebody would tell a joke, "Hi, Bob." Hey, look, there's Bob, and everybody would, ha, 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 and you go, where did that come from? You know, and it was the same <laughs> laugh track they did ten minutes earlier. You know, yeah, from I Love Lucy. Yeah, yeah. but so so it, it um, you know, but when it's when it, when there's a live audience there, I say, okay, you know, I'll I'll allow that. I don't watch a lot of sitcoms. Hence. Although, Lori, what, what are you watching these days? You know what I just finished? I finished on Netflix, Designated Survivor. Oh, really? Yeah. With Keeper? Yeah. Uh, I like the original show, but it wasn't that great. The new one, I think, is better than anything... On Netflix, is better than anything they ever did on the network. Oh, wow. To begin with, they take advantage of the fact that they can say... Four Dirty language. Words. Well, let me say this, and I'm not spoiling it because I'm not telling you why. The very last word that Kiefer Sutherland says after the 10 episodes, is shit. <laughs> uh, it, so it's a 10-episode Yeah, and, uh, and it's, it's really political. And what they've interspersed it with are real people talking to the camera about what they think is wrong with the country, made by documentary filmmakers. And they're like sitting there and say, look at this, this is on, uh, this is on YouTube. And then they'll play some clips and those clips are all legitimate, real people that they went out and filmed. So I kind of like the show. I think it's, it really is a vast improvement over what they were doing on ABC. Did you watch the first two seasons on ABC? Yes, I did. I felt the second season so-so. First season, I liked the premise. Yeah. Now the premise, you know, since you can't go with that premise that the guy, in case people don't remember, what happened was he, every time the, the Congress was meeting for the State of the Union address, the president, uh, they would have one person who was a designated survivor in case something happened to the entire a member country. of the cabinet. Right, member of the cabinet, and he's like, I don't know, I can't remember. Secretary of Housing and Urban S Development, something like yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, they, they blow up the Capitol, and he's the only one left alive, so he's the designated survivor. Well, that worked for a couple of seasons, but what do you do now? What they did came back with was, it's now time for him to run for president. He's never been elected president, and he's not the kind of guy who knows how to run for president. And all the things that come into play, and his, his desire for honesty, and uh, the consultant who says, no, you got to do this rather than this. And it really, I think, is a pretty good, uh, pretty good show this year. Did well, they find out, did they punish uh, the people who were responsible for the plot? I think that was in year two they found yeah. those people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But th this one, uh, you know, it's pretty, I think it's pretty good. And politically, I love it because, you know, one episode they had, for instance, I just got finished watching, was about uh, a, uh, a immigrant kid who the parents came over the border because he had to get a kidney transplant and needed dialysis. And they want to throw him out of the country because they came in illegally. And if they do, the kid will die. You know, so those kind of things, you know, yeah. and it's like, uh, they're kind of slamming. It, 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 let's face it, Kiefer Sutherland always was the anti-Trump. You know, he was the president we all wish we had. Yeah. So. Hey, listen, we've gone well over our allotted time, and we didn't. Oh even, no, no, no! I and I, I, have, I have so much more to say. Oh well, go ahead. To opine. Go ahead. Go ahead. We did, we mentioned Trump once, and that was just now when I was talking about. Kiefer Sutherland's character yeah, being so the tired of him. anti Trump. Yeah, I'm so tired of him. I, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think the whole country is. You know, I can I say this? We got we can go over a little bit here. Fuck him. I, I don't need. I can let you run long. Uh, I'm beginning to believe Buttigieg is the best choice. Buttigieg. And, 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 and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I feel it's it, it, it's it, he's the right choice. Is because. Um, I think if he were out there making his case, he could win. Uh, you know, and uh, I've listened to him, and he's smart, and he has ideas, and he can talk foreign policy, he can talk domestic policy. I think he could run rings around Trump if he ran. And in the latest polls, he's beating Trump. Yeah, yeah. 
So, Everybody does. I, I, and he hasn't well, even five five are. He hasn't five. even gotten his full. Biden, Bernie, Bernie. Booty, Booty Gig, uh, uh, Harris, and uh, some, uh, Elizabeth no. Warren. Elizabeth Warren. They're yeah. all beating Trump. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're all beating Trump. So we'll see. I'll, I'll be honest. I'd be okay with any of them except Bernie. I don't like Bernie. I don't like Bernie either. I know. We're, we're, we're going to be hated for that. People are going, yeah. oh, how can you hate Bernie? We love Bernie. What do you mean you yeah. love Bernie? I know people who know Bernie in Vermont and hate him. You know, and they're liberals. He's got <laughs> the sense of humor of an end table. Yeah, yeah. And I, I you yeah. know, I don't think, I don't really think he could win against Trump. I really don't. <laughs> but Buttigieg, I, I, I like him. I just like him, and I don't think the gay factor is going to be a problem. And he's young. And he's young, and and he's got ideas, and he you feel he'd go in running, you know, as opposed to crawling or waddling as Trump does, you know. So, whatever, you know. But uh, Trump, uh, who knows? He's all for the Russians helping him, so we <laughs> we don't know. And that's the next day he said he didn't say that. Uh, yeah, even though it's on tape. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, on tape. Yeah, hey, I'm insisting that what he's saying <laughs> is true, and then the next day he said he didn't say that, and then he doesn't believe the polls. Well, he the polls that came back from his internal polling said the same thing that the Fox News polls said about these other people being able to beat him, and, and that, so and then he fired his pollsters. He fired the pollsters. You know, that's uh, killing the messenger. Okay, <laughs> what the hell? Hey, listen. It's always great to talk to you. Say hello to your lovely wife. I'll talk to you in three weeks. Uh, and why don't you write her a nice note and tell her to close the windows? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Will fucking Durst. That's me. Five years and still talking. This is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. And thank you very much, Will Durst. We really appreciate your, uh, your having uh, something to do with our little uh, uh, radio party here, or internet party. Anyway, I'm opening up the lines here. There's no fill tonight. There's no fill tomorrow night. So that would be, that'd be three straight nights that we've gone without fill. Okay? And that, that's, uh, I, I think everybody uh, can take that little rest and enjoy it. So I'm now waiting to see people call so that we can fill up our uh, fill up our lines here. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's Josh Wheeler is our first caller this evening. Let me see here, and let me see if we can uh, find him a little slot here. Uh, na -na 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 -na. And we go, Josh Wheeler. There he is. There we go with that. Uh, and. Um, uh, you haven't got your camera on, Josh. We need your camera on. There we go. Okay, there he we go, and there he is. How are you doing, Josh? Wait a minute. Here comes Tom. Here, how you doing? Here comes Tom Yamaguchi, uh, and uh, we uh, just uh, let's see here. Uh, added him to the group. Let's see. Did we add him to the group? Did he get added? Uh, that's Tom, and uh, there's Charlie, but Tom is still having a problem. We're having a problem with Tom getting him on. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Let me see here. Oh, wait a minute. Jeff Stein. Okay. J Jeff uh, will be in there. Okay, so he's in the number two slot. Let me... Uh, Steindeller. Okay. Uh, let me see here. All right. Uh, now I need to. I need. I think I need to call uh, Tom Yamaguchi here. Hold on a second, so that we can get him on. I don't know what his problem was, but um, we have a way of handling this. So, you know, we're now calling. If you're listening, Tom, we're calling you. So answer the goddamn phone, okay? <laughs> Uh, and uh, that will be that would be very nice if you did that. Um, let's see here. Um, come on, Tom, answer, answer. Maybe there's something <coughs> wrong with his uh, line. I don't know. But anyway, hello, gentlemen. How are you this evening? Good, good. Yeah. Happy. What? Happy. You're happy. Why are you happy? I don't know. It's so goddamn 
raining today. I just stayed in home. <laughs> really? I was so glad it was raining today, and I can explain why to you in a second. Wait a minute, let me just get Tom Yamaguchi in here. There we go. See, Tom, we can I, even get I, you on. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I got get, getting a message that the signal was too weak, and then I didn't realize that, that you were actually trying to call me. It didn't actually say you were trying to call me. It, but anyway, when I realized well, that well, was the case... Well, I that thing about it being too weak has been a problem that they've had for a while, but we haven't been having it that much. It hasn't been happening that often, but it happened with you tonight. But, well, it happened but, to me for the first time. But here you are, so there we go. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, I am. And uh, would you like to hear about Keith or Sutherland? Yeah, sure. Oh. Uh, because I mentioned him before. Um, he, uh, he, a number of years ago, he did a documentary I saw on um, Canadian health care. Yeah, because he's from Canada. Yeah, the, uh, the health care movie. I really recommend it. It's basically what they do is they go up, talk to Canadians about how they like their health care, and they dismiss a lot of the myths and say, Oh, that hey, you know, all the long lines, it's terrible. No, they love it up there. Really? And the reason why Keith or Sutherland uh, is doing the, uh, did the narration is he's related, I think, on his mother's side to mm -hmm. Tommy Douglas, yep. who's the prime minister of, um, of Canada, who actually gave Canadians, uh, you know, what we would hear called Medicare for all or, you know, universal health care. Excuse Super me, I'm care. taking this yeah. off because it's getting too, it's too hot in here tonight. Yeah. Anyway. But anyway, that's, that's Keith or Sutherland. Well, good. It, it, I kind of like this show. Uh, it, uh, politically, it's everything you want it to be, you know. Uh, it's very agree agreeable to our line of thinking. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's better than it was when it was on a network. And I think they felt they had a certain freedom that they would, to be political that they never had on, the, on, the, uh, on ABC. So. Yeah, I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Although I know about the designated survivor. Usually it's the Secretary of Energy. <laughs> well, that's what this guy but, was, I think. Something like that. I think you said he was HUD. HUD but maybe something in, like in that. Reality, yeah. Usually they'll, 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 you know, like Stephen Chu's, it's how oh, you stay awake. <laughs> so, so they actually do have a designated survivor. Yes. Yeah. In case, oh, yeah. in case the place blows up and everybody's, because everybody's in the same place at the same time. Right. Which is a perfect place for terrorism to take place. Yes. Yeah. Well, what I always say is here in Berkeley, uh, the first Wednesday of of the month at noon they test out the sirens so i say to all the terrorists hey if you want to attack our city that's a great time that's a to great do time to do it think, right oh it's just a test <laughs> <laughs> oh boy so anyway so uh, uh, so you you're you're mad today jeff because it's raining right yeah and uh uh i'm happy that it is <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I've been feeling really crappy lately. And uh, it came to a, a head on Sunday where I just said, I got to do something about this. Because I was just feeling like my throat was all trashed. And I didn't know whether it was my heart. I didn't know what it was. So I went to, I went to one of these, uh, the uh, City MD, which is like a clinic, you know. Um uh, and and they're the my doctor isn't open on Sunday, so I figured I would go and just see. I I figured maybe it was allergies or whatever. And the guy went and he got all proactive and he gave me a, a chest X-ray, which proved nothing. I have a wonderful chest, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I could show you the pictures because they gave me a little DVD to take home of my chest. Um, and then they gave me an EKG. Well. My EKGs never come out okay, okay, because I have a heart murmur. And so it always comes out that they can't read it completely. They can't make a definitive statement through an EKG, which I told him before he even did it, right? So he said, well, if I were you, I would go to your doctor tomorrow and see him about this. So I made an appointment the next morning. My doctor saw me really early, and uh, I went in, and he checked out my... Uh, uh, he, uh, he checked me out and he, he said, well, the electrocardiogram, because I gave him the 
I, we didn't even have to do one. I gave him the one that I had. And he said, yeah, it's, that's you. We know that. You know, he said, but just to be on the safe side, we haven't it's been two years since we did an echocardiogram on you. So let's do an echocardiogram, which is really kind of, right? am I right, Jeff? It's kind of like a sonogram of the heart, right? With a few extra bells and whistles. Turn on your microphone. We can't hear you. Uh, Simple procedure. Yeah. No risk. Yeah, and it pretty well gives you a good idea of what's happening down there. Sure. You know. So he checked it out, and um, I gained about two, two centimeters or something. I don't know on my on my uh, 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 aortic stenosis. He said if it keeps growing at this rate, he said uh, you'll be dead in about another fifty years. <laughs> you know. Uh, so he said nothing to worry about. Looks good. The rest of your heart looks terrific. So it's not your heart. He said, I bet it is, uh, it is uh, allergies. It is pollen, you know. And uh, today it started raining and I felt better. You know, I didn't feel as bad. Yeah, I still felt, you know, that I had something. But the chest wasn't, you know, hurting me as much. And the, today the eyes are watering. That's what the rain does for some reason. But I was talking, I was talking to Durst, right? And he said to me, well, you can mitigate the pollen by keeping your windows closed. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. Huh? My, just tell that to my wife who will not close the fucking windows. The only time she closes the windows because we're on the eighth floor and when, it, when it's raining a pisser out there and the water's streaming in through the windows and then she'll close <clears throat> the windows. But unless uh, that's the case, you know, I told her, well, I've got allergies, and it looks like the pollen's really acting up, and if we could close the windows, it might help. And she went, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so whatever, you know. Ask me to get you your crutch the next time your leg goes bad, you know. <laughs> uh, you know but, I mean, uh, it, it, but it, it does. You can help with the pollen by keeping your windows <clears throat> closed and probably getting yourself what? A, is there some kind of little device you can get that takes the, the pollen out of the air and so on? You know. So, uh, so I, I, I spent a lot on doctors this weekend. So, well, not, I didn't. My medical plan did, but, you know. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, does anybody ever go to these uh, these uh, like like City MD or these clinics? Yeah, yeah I go. To yeah, they're very good, aren't they? Yeah, I, I've gone a couple of times, and uh, they're pretty good. And I remember the last time I went there, uh, she goes, "Well, I tell you what, I'm going to call up Yale and tell them that you're on the way." Tell who? Yale at the university. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I said, "Well, do you work there also?" She goes, "Yeah, I do that too." No. So uh, she, she said, "I think it's uh, time for a little checkup on uh, with the cardiologist." Yeah. So, yeah. Just no big deal. Yeah, but you know, I I go to them when I've got something where I feel like I've got like an infection or a cold <clears throat> or something like that, and why why waste my doctor's time with that, you know? Uh, and they handle that kind of stuff very nicely. And if they think it's something worse, they're not gonna they're not gonna hesitate in telling you to call your doctor or get over to the hospital immediately. You know. Is that guy or gal called the PE? What? No. It, 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 this it, I get a different doctor every time I've gone down there. Okay. There's some doctors who are not full. Oh, these doctors. are full doctors. These are full there's doctors. But they're very good. Yeah, these are full doctors. Oh, you're talking about, uh, oh, yeah, I know what PAs. you're talking about. What? what? What's the term? PAs, the physician's assistant. Yeah. 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 No, no these, yeah. this is a real doctor. I mean, you, you've got the physician's assistants there do all the work up on you in the beginning. And then he comes in and he does the, he checks you out, you know. Uh, and, I mean, I like the fact that this guy was, you know, very careful about making sure that I didn't just let this thing go, you know, and, uh, 
it was a, it's a good first place to go. And then I talked to my doctor yesterday, and I said, I, you know, I felt guilty. I, I went to a city MD, and he said, oh, no, that's perfectly fine. He said, that's sometimes the first place to go because, you know, I'm, I'm not on, open on Sunday, you know. Um, but uh, he, uh, he said, no, I, I, he believes in those places and thinks they do a very good job, you know. So, what the hell? Do you go to, um, what's it, the Presbyterian? What? Do you go to the Presbyterian hospital? No, I go to, I go to the hospital I say I'm going to die in. Uh, Mount Sinai. Okay. Yeah, I uh, Mount Sinai is the closest. If I'm gonna, dr if I'm, if I have a heart incident or I break a leg or something, the first place I call will be Mount Sinai. And as we pass by my by, by Mount Sinai on the bus going home from downtown, um, I look at it and I say to Marjorie, I think that's that's where we're gonna die. This is the exit plan. <laughs> This, this is the yeah. This is the exit plan, you know. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, I've just been feeling like crap. I mean, just really terrible. And he said to me that this is the, maybe the worst pollen season we've had ever. Mm. You know that it, it's just terrible. And he said uh, he said he he says up where I live, which is up in Westchester, he says. You should see the car is filled with pollen when I come out yes. in the morning, you know. So, uh, so anyway, I uh, today I was feeling a little better. So, I, what the hell, you know? I'm not as lightheaded today, whatever. But I would, I'll be happy to be through with this and go to sleep. <laughs> you know, I'm exhausted. <laughs> oh, and then, then tonight before we go on, it's you know, it's always something, and I. Uh, I've really got to take my hat off to Damien. To begin with, uh, uh, there's, he's a great guy to work with, you know. I mean, he, he, but he had a problem tonight. Well, he didn't have a problem. He got himself a new computer, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And he installed the new computer, but all the stuff that would help him code the program wasn't working. So up until his airtime, we were trying to get the thing working, and then I know, it turned out that he has two ways to run that computer either in windows 10 or windows 7 and so he simply switched over to windows 7 and everything worked all right so i had that before i went on the air tonight and where i could usually spend the half hour that he's on relaxing taking it easy having my cup of coffee you know uh doing whatever uh we had to deal with that so that that was a little adventure tonight so <laughs> But anyway, um, I, uh, um, you know, I'm, I, I get increasingly bothered by the fact that, like, tonight uh, Donald Trump held a rally to announce he's running for president again. What a surprise, okay? Yeah. Uh, and and next, in the next couple of weeks, we've got this, uh, the, these debates between the Democratic candidates. And I'm going... Isn't this too soon? I mean, we're still a year and a half away from even voting. I mean, what, what, what's going on here? This is getting to be overkill. Yes, Tom. Well, I mentioned the last time I was on, it's a lot of it is money. You know, the candidates have to, to raise a lot of money, and it just pushes further and further and further. And then it's a media pylon. Well, we got to have a front runner. We got to have one front runner. You're right. Hurry up and hurry up and hurry up and wait. You know, I mean, they want us to have a nominee by, you know, next March. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be another, you know, till November. It's, you know, it, it, it is ridiculous. I, I agree. But, but that's the way the system is right now. And it's only been made worse by Citizens United. I mean, you can, you could just, you could, partially blame or or actually mostly blame it on that you know it's just like the money thing has just gotten even worse well maybe we have to take the money out of it huh yeah yeah let's let's get rid of i mean if we're, if we're gonna have the democracy we admire the one that we tout as being the best thing ever you know uh i think maybe we need to do something about uh, that whole system of, of, of funding campaigns and the time that we sp the time we spend having people run nobody should declare until the first day of the election year 
You know, well, you know, in uh, when when Jack Kennedy announced he was running for president in 1960, I think it was maybe the second day or of January of that mm -hmm. year that he yeah. announced. Yeah. And and the first primary, I think, uh, I think New Hampshire was the first Tuesday in March. Yep. That yep. was the first primary. Oh, well, you know what happened? The primaries. First, first you had, well, you have the Vermont primary and you have the Iowa caucus. And you I'm mean New Hampshire. New, ha <laughs> no, yeah. New Hampshire, excuse me. New Hampshire and then the Iowa caucus. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Iowa caucus is first and then the New Hampshire primary. I don't even remember the Iowa caucus when I was younger. I mean, that seems well, to be, it might have happened, but I don't think well, anybody... I'll tell you, I went, I went to the Iowa caucus. Uh, I know, but one, that was 2008. Yeah, uh, 2008. <laughs> but I went to the Iowa caucus, and I, you know, I was saying to myself, what are caucuses all about, and why are they necessary? And I liked it because it was a true expression of politics, you know, and of, of, of the common man being able to give you his vote. And it, it just they would all meet in various places like schools and then they would all uh, uh, line up in front of people who had signs for various candidates and then those people would try to convince the other people to come over to their line and eventually by the end of the night you came out with kind of a consensus at least at that school or at that place that caucusing place and then all those results then went into the main, you know, uh, uh, polling place or whoever did the main adding up of everything, and they came out with their with their nominees. I thought that that was so democratic and so proactive that I I really felt every state should be doing that. And if people don't go to those caucuses, then fuck them, you know. You didn't participate. You had a chance to truly participate in something hands on. And you didn't. Yeah. Yes, uh, Tom. Well, it works out fine for people who are free that night. They can go to a caucus that night and spend that amount of time. I mean, but it's only two, it was only two. Families, it was, it was, they have other yeah. obligations. Yeah, but, and to say fuck them, I think is sort of well. Right. Well, I, 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 well, I mean, <laughs> I don't think that this took any more time than it would take the average person. Okay to uh, uh, vote, uh, to uh, rather to uh, you just go out and vote. It was not, a, it was not, a, it was a fast process. It didn't take all night and it wasn't, you know, and, and it, it was kind of, there was kind of a social aspect to it that I liked, you know? It's like your neighbors are all getting together to, you know, make this decision. Uh, you know, when you talk about that, about people not being able to do things, I mean, why in the world do we have election days on Tuesday? Yeah, we don't why don't we have them uh, uh, for, a, a, say, a full day uh, on, on Sunday? Or on Saturday, if you're really religious. Well, if you're Jewish, maybe you don't want to go on Saturday. But I just think, or either that, or just, you know, we were always looking for a way to kind of equalize the days out, why don't we make a non-day once every four years? And that non-day would be election day. Wouldn't be, we can go to work, you know. Need a federal ho holiday. Federal holiday, but it's not a day at all. It doesn't have a day on it, a date. Well, I mean, you can make a federal holiday. Uh, there also, you can uh, encourage uh, early voting, which the Republicans do everything they can to suppress. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you know, allow for early voting. Uh, a, lo a lot of more uh, people here in California are using the vote by mail ballots. They don't even call them absentee ballots anymore. They call them vote by mail ballots. And a lot of people, when I'm working the polls, a lot of the ballots that come in are people coming right off the street. They've got their vote by mail ballot in the envelope. They just stuff it in the in the in the in the bin. And they're on their way. What about uh, what about us eventually? And I know you're probably not going to like this voting online. If it can be secure, you know, if it can be how, secure. How is it any? How, how, how is it going to be any less secure than the polling places? We know that you know for years 
the hell, some of the ballots would wind up in the in the river. You know, I mean, anybody who wants to play around with an election can do it if they really have the desire to do so. You know. So. Well, the idea is having enough checks and balances to ensure that, and you know, for you know, for, uh, and I all I know is California, and uh, you know, we always make sure that we've got a paper trail, and mm -hmm. we have to count those ballots. I mean, it's the real pain of that job is the end of the night because everything, mm -hmm. every ballot has to be accounted for, every one when it goes back. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, so you just have to have the, the checks. Well, you know, this is, this is all state by state, though. I mean, there are some states that are just purely still to this day corrupt, you know. And, uh, and that's how true. confident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I just think that it, we, need to, we need to change the whole way we do elections. I mean, I, I believe that what we should do is, I've, I've been yelling and screaming about doing away with the primaries. And I want to do away with the primaries because I, I see that they are only a function for the parties. And, and by the way, those primaries don't really uh, uh, do much for the minor parties at all. But it becomes a big, large advertising vehicle for the uh, for the major parties. Oh, who's going to win the primary? Who's going to win the Democratic primary? Who's going to win the Republican? Who's going to win the Green Party? Well, we don't care. Where's their convention? Oh, well, they don't get televised. You know, I mean, it, I just think primaries are useless. Let's do what we used to do, uh, and and we we go back into the nineteenth, you know, back into the last century to when they did this. And just have all these guys go to their convention and make their case, and somebody comes out the nominee, and then tell us who it is, and we'll we'll either vote or, not, or for one or the other. But but you don't we don't start uh, having you campaign till after the convention is over with. So we've got about a four month period in which people are campaigning, and we've shortened that whole window, like all the other countries in the world. Yeah, Tom. And the last century, blacks and women didn't vote either. They would go back to that side. State <laughs> legislatures actually chose our senators, so people didn't vote on those either. They would go back to those days, too. <laughs> well, no. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we, we very, up until very recently, didn't have primaries. They were not a major factor in deciding the present, you know, the nominee of the parties. And I want to find some way to shorten this whole window. I want who's ever president to be president and not be running again for president two days after he's elected the first time. Yes, yes, who, uh, yes, uh, Josh. Josh. Yeah, I, I kind of agree there. I, I, I wish we had more of a national primary, you know, day. Instead of them being so straightened out, I mean, I don't have a problem with you know having the primary and letting the people choose their nominee. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the way the process takes so long from beginning to end because sometimes, you know, like in Ohio, I think we're fairly, you know, like middle to just after the middle. I think so. If you live here, for instance, and you really like a certain person, you may not really actually get a chance to vote for them, or the vote that you cast for them. Mm -hmm. might not count very well because by the time they get to Ohio it's usually either sewn up or narrowed down to the point where it doesn't matter and uh, and I'm just throwing out names I'm not saying who I'm for or against I'm just saying for instance if you really like you know Kamala Harris or something mm -hmm. you know by the time they get to Ohio there may actually be a lot of people nationally that like her but she may not even but she may have to drop out of the race after like South Carolina or something just because she didn't do very well in like the first three or four states. But, you know, there's 45 or 46 other states that she didn't even really get to represent herself in because she didn't get past the first two or three. So who's really choosing our nominee? Iowa, South Carolina, New Hampshire and, you know, Nevada, which that's not very representative of America. You know, I mean. That's that's my problem with the problem. Well, I, I just think it should be the job of the party to to decide who the nominee is going to be, 
and then let us see your nominee, and if we like them, we'll vote for them, and if we don't like them, we won't vote for them. Yes, Tom? Yeah, Josh has an excellent point. That's another reason why this, this thing just gets so accelerated. Like, next year, California is actually going to separate out its primaries. So they're going to have a presidential primary in March and a regular primary in June. And frequently, I mean, this happened last night, and this happened in 2008. Once again, many of the candidates, uh, you know, uh, were dropped out. And and in June, with the with the with uh, with uh, with Clinton and, and Obama, they were still fighting out. We could have had our primary in June and still had the same choices. And we're and so because we had already had the presidential primary. The regular primary for the state and local offices, where you know hardly anybody showed up, right? Yeah. And and just to just to just to reflect on the fact that that the primaries are more than just the presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. There's state and local. There's also propositions on those on those ballots too. So it's more than just just the primaries choosing their president. Yeah, but wouldn't those wouldn't Lots those have Yeah, but those, those are those, those are only those, that election. those are only piggybacked onto the primaries because there's an election being held. But if they didn't do that, they could still have their own elections for those issues, you know, for those ballot problems. But we have assembly we we have assembly members, we have state senators uh, every 4 years, well, yeah, every 4 years the state senators, the governors, those are include primaries too. Well, I, I just think that we, we, we need to do something to speed this whole process up because I don't want to have to even worry about who's running for president until Shorten. January. Shorten it. Compress it. Yeah, but you're not going to compress it as long as these people go, hey, it's, it's uh, April. I better uh, say I'm running now. You know what? You know, right now, think about it, folks. We're only... Uh, three, uh, three, uh, excuse me, two and a half years into this presidency, and already we're having everybody run for the next term. It, it makes no sense. It's not. It number one. It's 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 not a good idea because people get a little tired of it early. But secondly, and I have to say this, in spite of the fact, as much as I hate Trump, I mean he was elected president. Let him worry about the next time he runs next year, right? Not now. Let him do his job, although he hasn't so far. But, you know, I can expect, I can hope, you know. So, I mean, I just, I just think it's, it's not a very good process all the way around, you know. No. Yeah, so. That's what I had to say. Uh, okay. <laughs> what do the Democrats have now? Over... 20 people? Who uh, are trying 20, 24. To I think it's 24, isn't it, everybody? <laughs> I don't know. They, they have 20 that I believe made their cut for their debate. Yeah. yeah. There are How like many are actually running as a Democrat, I believe, is higher than that. It's around 24. Or five more, I think. Yeah. yeah. Something yeah. around that. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Way too many. And, and my, you know, I, I would like to say that I find it unfair that those other people, I mean, let's face it, if you're spreading it out over two nights and let's say it's 24, that only adds two more people to the mix, you know. So make your, your debate two and a half hours instead of two hours and make sure that everybody has a real chance. Because there might be somebody in that mix who isn't being paid attention to or really has something important to say and that a debate might make that person shine. But they can't because they get, don't get to sit at the big guy's table. You know. Yeah. You know, I look at it like the way the basketball games are where, you know, the guys from the California go after these guys and then the ones from the East go against those and then ultimately they cut it down. I think when you have so many, it's just ridiculous. Well, I, I was watching MSNBC today. You should not have 10 people. I was, I was watching MSNBC today, which is not my real big choice for viewing these days. My big choice is I watch uh, uh, CBSN, which I feel actually reports the news, where the, where the um, MSNBC is reporting liberal news and Fox is reporting conservative news, uh, CBSN is actually reporting the news, you know, and I, I find that more refreshing. 
But I was watching MSNBC today, and this uh, Steve Karnacki, who I can't stand, he, with him with his board, with the, all his statistics and stuff like that, you know, uh, is, is standing there saying, here are the way they're going to be positioned at the podium and the spots that they have. <laughs> and I'm going, my God, even this is unfair, you know? I mean, the person who's in the center obviously is going to be the center of attention. So, I mean, it's just... It's, it's, I don't find it a very democratic process. Yes, Jeff. Well, who's running the show? The, de uh, the Democratic National Committee supposedly is. I thought they had some uh, guys from uh, you know, MSNBC. What, well, no, 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 what it is. No, the, the, the MSNBC is running it, but it's being... Uh, Hosted by or looked over Organized. by Moderated, yeah. by by the Democratic National Committee. Now, do you remember who used to hold the debates? League of Women Voters. That's correct. Oh, yeah, that's right. And where do they stand politically? Nowhere. Nowhere. You know, and that was, I think, fair. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. but I don't think the League of Women Voters has anything to do with any of these debates anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. Hey, we gave him the vote. That's enough. <laughs> you know. I mean, uh, but I just, you know, I just, I, I, I'm, you know, and all of a sudden you got, you got Trump tonight. He's back to the same old stuff, you know, uh, the, the fake news and the Russia probe and all of that. And he's, that's his, what he's running on. Is he nuts? Well, we don't, oh, I'm, answer, I'm a asking a stupid question. You know. Yeah, it's always complaining about Clinton. Yeah. This is stupid. Yeah, he's still, you know, he um, he is he's amazing. Uh, did you see any anybody see the interview he did with uh, Stephanopoulos? No. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, he, he yeah he, he he the man the man has totally lost it. I mean, it's okay to listen. To a foreign government when they come to you with information about people who are running against you? I mean, come on. I mean, hmm. maybe that's the way you did things in New York illegally, but I mean, we don't do that nationally. You're president of the United States. You yeah. have to set the tone for the rest of the country. That's what the president, among other things, does, and you're setting a bad example. Yes, Tom. Yeah, I was just saying earlier you were saying, you know, you know, why don't you just let Trump, you know, do, do his uh, two, you know, three, three, four years just running the country, not worry about being president. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be the only interest he has in the job is actually running for president. Yep. I mean, he, I mean, I mean, it's a joke that 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 this is his kickoff route. He spent, he he took out papers as soon as he was inaugurated. He's yeah. been doing these rallies constantly. He's there. There's the only things. He's really interested in are the rallies. You know why? You know why? Him. You know why? Because he likes the adulation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean these these rallies are large scale, you know, ring kissing ceremonies, mm -hmm. and you know he is the type that likes to have the ring kissed. You know, and and sadly. Our society has evolved in a way, and I don't know why, I mean, I don't have the answer, but our society has evolved in a way so as, at least recently, our politics has become much like, you know, our sport. And that if you're my guy, you can almost get away with whatever because I want to win. You know, like you said with uh, some of the comments he made about accepting help from a foreign leader mm. or whatever, I mean, 10 years ago probably even. That would have been like, well, this guy's done. Off the map. See you later. You know, he's from Cuckooville. Send him back where he came from. The village called. They like their idiot back. You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, the whole thing. And now it's 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 evolved to where it's like sports. You know, the best player on our team, our running back. He beat the shit out of his wife, and he beat his kid up this week. And it's Tuesday, and it's like, well, that's really not great, but. Is he going to make bail? Can he play Sunday? You know, I mean, that's where we're at, you know, like in sport, for example. And that's kind of how politics has evolved. It's like, 
you know, oh, I wish you wouldn't have said that, but, you know, I want to win. You know, I, I don't want to be, my neighbor is a Democrat, and I, I, I don't want to listen to his mouth if I lose, you know, because that's the way people are, and I just, I don't I don't know the answer. I mean, how the hell do we get away from that? I mean, because th- that's what's ruining it. Well, I mean, it, it, and it doesn't get any better. It doesn't any, get any better. And it is exacerbated by these news organizations. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're ginning it all up. Right. I mean, yeah, sure. I'm a, I'm I'm to, I'm I'm a lefty, but I don't like MSNBC because I feel they're sucking my dick. Yeah. You know, and while normally I would like somebody who sucked my dick, in this particular case, um, I, I I just don't like being co- uh, uh, pandered yeah. to. You know, and, and they they they've taken a page out of the sports book, right? I mean. You know, the, they're the one, like you said, you know, they're they're going to give you your six hours of pregame every Sunday, it, right? It, you <laughs> know something? They may as well go out and get sports reporters to cover the election. Right. Because really, these, that's all we're really doing is they're, they, oh, and here's where everybody's going to be positioned on the day of the debate, <laughs> yeah. okay? And this is the lineup for today's game. He's going to be yeah. here, and he's the quarterback. And, you know, I mean... I'm sorry. I just I I don't. Maybe uh, am I am I an old fart? Is that what it is? No, I I I think that's how it's evolved. I mean, and I'm almost I'm I'm being serious. I mean, sports has been highly successful and a big money maker in this country for you know decades. I mean, maybe you know century. Yeah. And the news, you know, never was really a big money maker. Right. And if you turn politics into a form of entertainment such as what sport is Mm -hmm. you can make more money and and each person that gets in the game becomes more famous i mean reporters uh who report the news if it weren't like this might have you know five thousand twitter followers and they can get fifty thousand twitter followers and that gets you a book right because you cover a campaign for two years and then you can write a book about it. And even if it's not a huge book, hell, you made $100,000. Even if that's all you make, well, that's $100,000 that you wouldn't, you know. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. that's what it's, it's, it's like it makes a career. Out, everyone's making a career out of doing it. Um, I'm looking at Drudge because I was looking for the name. Uh, first, let's go to Charlie. No, good. I, I just wanted to point out that that all of this started when news all of a sudden became a money making uh, yeah. entity. Before I don't know what Reagan or somebody, it, it, it uh, the news could not make money. It had it had to be a law. I mean, they had to report to benefit the public, and they not to the, not to get ratings and not to make you know money. And then once they were freed up to make money, then they had to do they had to trump up all of these controversies and stuff so that so that people would watch them instead of another channel, mm-hmm. so they could make more money. I have a uh, uh, Tom. Well, I said I have a special beef with MSNBC, which I don't watch uh, because I don't watch cable. I don't, I don't even have cable, so I don't watch cable news. But I was, my special beef with, with MSNBC is the fact, of course, the conservatives for years have been saying, oh, the, the, the news has a liberal bias and, and, and you know, and uh, it goes back to Goldwater. Uh, and so when Fox came along with their fair and balanced, I mean, I interpreted the meaning we're going to be balanced by giving right wing news and then we're going to be that what that'll in itself will make us fair, but then MSNBC turns turns around and says, "Oh, well, if they're doing right wing news, we'll do left wing news." And so, what are they doing? They're validating Fox's new, uh, you know, the conservative viewpoint that news is biased. You know, I mean, well, that that's the reason why, and I I, I said this earlier that I I have suddenly started watching M, uh, CBSN. Yeah. Because what I found, two things. Number one, uh, as I said, MSNBC says we're going to be the news for the left. And Fox goes, we're going to be the news for the, for the right. And CBSN says, we're going to be news. Yeah. 
And what they're doing is, yeah, they're reporting all the stuff that was around today, but without bias, okay, without a bent on it. They report it. Here's what's happening. Here's what Trump said today. And then they get to other news, like here's what's happening in Afghanistan today, and this happened in Syria today, and this happened in London today, and this, you know, in other words, <clears throat> the worldview of the news, and, and important news, things that affect you and me. I mean, the Hong Kong thing is a major story, and I don't really see any of those other networks leading with that story, and that's a big, big story. Yeah, yeah, yeah Tom. Oh, yeah, just to, just to, just one more thing about yes, and, and it's true. Everybody has a bias, mm -hmm. and certainly reporters have bias mm -hmm. biases. But a professional recognizes their bias and actually works to seek out mm -hmm. uh, information to counteract or contradict that bias. And that's the difference be between what we a professional journalist would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what are we going to do? I mean, you know, what's what's the answer here? The answer is, I think we have to. You know, I find when I say to some people who are liberals how terrible I find MSNBC, they they think I'm I'm a conservative. Well, what do you do? You watch Fox? No, I mean I watch the BBC and I watch CBSN. I go to places where I can watch the news, see it with my own two eyes and make my opinion out of it as I'm watching it, you know? And not have people tell me what I'm supposed to be thinking or to mm -hmm. play to, you know, to pander to my, my uh, better nature. Uh, I, don't, I don't like that. It just is not right, you know? So anyway, I, I was looking at this thing. I was looking at, I went to Drudge because what I wanted to find out was today we had a, a secretary, a, a acting secretary of defense resign, who was going to be the next secretary of defense, but unfortunately it turns out he had, he had something in his past which, quite frankly, I don't think should have disqualified him. It was a domestic dispute in which he claimed his wife hit him and she claimed he hit her. And then uh, she took the kid, and uh, they separated, and then the kid hit the mother with a baseball bat. You know, oh. it's, uh, yeah, it was, it's like a whole, but it was, I, I almost felt bad for the guy because it wasn't, it didn't seem like he had done anything particularly wrong, that, uh, that it was a family dispute, and she was accusing him of stuff that he didn't do, and he was accusing her of stuff she did. That's the way it looked. Uh, but it happened 10 years ago, something like that, you know. And um, it, what, what really made me sad is that right now there's this whole thing going on uh, in, uh, uh, off of, uh, off of um, Iran uh, with that uh, ship, the oil tankers, being attacked, maybe. I don't know. Do you buy that story, by the way? Uh, I don't buy that Iran did it. Huh? You don't buy that Iran did it? Nope. Okay. Yeah. Because I, uh, I, I certainly um, don't. Uh, I, I have my doubts. Okay, that uh, they, you know, that they, they did it. Um, uh, I would like to think maybe they. You know, it, it's horrible if they if they did, but uh, uh, there's a good question as to whether that uh, that really went went on. Okay. Anyway, yes, Tom. I would say it's very possible that they did do it, mm -hmm. and I say that there are very there are strong forces in both the U.S. and Iran that mm -hmm. actually want war. Yeah. And uh, and and I'm. I don't know any more than anybody else does, but I think it's curious that uh, that one of the people that were ner most nervous about getting into war with Iran was this guy um, whose name I'm the the Boeing guy who just dropped out as Secretary of State. Yeah, leaving. Uh, what's his name? I'm trying to remember his name. I was looking. I was looking. I, I went to Drudge. Okay. I'm having, I'm having a senior moment. I went to Drudge because I figured his name would be there, and he's just. Okay. Well, he, anyway, what, what's his name? Not even mentioned. But anyway, yeah. but but so so he's out of the picture. 
Who's mm-hmm. left? Pompeo and John Bolton. Yeah. And you know damn well John Bolton wants yeah. to go to a war with Iran. I mean, could, and just to add this, I mean, Iran has announced that, you know, since, since Trump has pulled out of the deal, they're going to go ahead and start developing a nuclear bomb again. So well, did you did you hear the best the best thing that happened was in the case of uh, of uh, Pompeo said to Iran uh, through the Japanese prime minister who was there on a visit, will you please tell Iran that we would like to have some kind of talks about de-escalating this or whatever, and uh, Iran told the prime minister of Japan, tell them basically to go fuck themselves because you know Trump has talked so badly yeah. about us and has created such a bad atmosphere with mm-hmm. us that we really don't want to do business with him so now we have a president that nobody wants to do business with because of, of the way he's been treating him he, the, the United imagine Pompeo believing that he could actually get Iran to talk after all the things that Trump has said about Iran by the way, Patrick Shanahan. Patrick Shanahan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing about the election season coming along so early, and Trump brings this, you know, upon himself, is, you know, the divide here is so great, mm-hmm. and it's getting started so early, and he's done nothing to, you know, buck that trend. If anything, he's accelerated it, mm-hmm. is he almost is making himself a quasi lame duck if you will anyway so if you're you know iran at least if it were me i would say well listen you know he, he, why negotiate with this fool he's probably out in two years anyway right. you know let's just tell him to go you know suck a dick for the next two years and then see who we get next and maybe you know when america returns to a more normal you know uh you know, chain of events, we can negotiate with the next person. I mean, I'm not well, saying, uh, here, 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 duck, I'm here, saying here, you know, here, in that sense. Yeah, but here, here's the here's the shitty part of it. Okay, is that you had um, you had uh, 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 we had a treaty with Iran that they weren't going to continue their nuclear program. We then backed out of it because of Trump deciding he was yeah. going to back out of it. And then we weren't part of that treaty anymore. And now they're going, oh, well, fuck you. Then we'll start building our nukes again. Exactly. I mean, how did, how, how did he feel he was serving any greater purpose by taking the stance that he took? Mm-hmm. He's not. He, he's a, he, I mean, he's a dangerous person. I mean, that's been my opinion since well before he was elected. I mean, before he was even the nominee, you know. He's a dangerous person. I, I, I mean, I, I think anybody people, like a Trump would be dangerous. In other words, somebody yeah. who you take from the the uh, private sector and mm-hmm. make him yeah. president of the United well, States. Somebody but, right, who doesn't. That's what even, I'm saying is, I mean, Trump is the guy who's talked like all the hillbillies where I live sit around their table and talk. You know, well, I'll just tell them all go fuck himself. You know. They want to make a bomb, go ahead and make a bomb. We'll make a bigger bomb. Blow their ass away. And, and that's, that's nonsense. But that's what, you know, people say when they're sitting around eating their fucking Kentucky Fried Chicken or whatever. Yeah. And he comes along and, you know, he talks this fucking nonsense. And it happens to come at a time when a lot of people bought into it, you know, because of other political tiredness with the... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, status quo or whatnot, and, you know, and then you throw in a third party who, you know, probably helped, you know, with their hand in it a little bit here and there. I'm not saying it was because of that. I'm saying it was a combination of, you know, things, and, and he gets himself elected, and then he, you know, he continues that type of rhetoric, and there's a reason that people in the past haven't used it, because it's dangerous, and it doesn't work. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Patrick. Hola. Hola, yeah. Um, uh, you, you know what I what what's interesting is is that this guy what's his name Shanahan or Sh- Shanahan yeah Shanahan Shanahan uh, huh Patrick Shanahan. Patrick Shanahan yeah. uh, oh, Nelson Patrick yeah well <laughs> we don't need to remember his name because he's gone now but 
Uh, he was acting Secretary of Defense. Now, right now, we need a Secretary of Defense. All right? Yeah, we're going to but we only had an acting Secretary of Defense. And it's amazing how many people in his administration are an acting something. He doesn't yeah. appoint permanent people to anything. Well, he can't get anyone to work for him. I mean... You know, in, 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 in a lot, I mean, the only people that really go and work for him, it's been clear to me, are people, and I've made this argument many times, people are probably getting tired of it, but they are people that are just so desperate to sit at the right hand of power that they will sell their fucking soul mm -hmm. to the Trump, Trump devil. You know, even though they know that six or eight or ten months later, they're going to, you know, look at him the wrong way one day, and he's going to stab him in the back and get his phone out and type nasty things about him, ruin their reputation, make it to where everyone hates him. Uh, but it's like, but that eight or nine months that I was in the room, you know, it, it was worth it. You know, I, I mean, is that what they think? I don't know. I mean, I guess I used to have more faith in people, and I've just learned, you know, I guess people are just stupid. I mean, there's no other way to... I don't know what to think of that, but that has to be what it is because he has trouble attracting people to work for him. I mean, it's like, you know, the only people that will take it are the bottom of the rung, you know, desperate people that probably wouldn't have gotten a job in a more mainstream administration, and you see what is getting us. I mean, that's, again, he's a dangerous well, person. Would you want to have worked for him? <laughs> I mean... I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, and, and he just... You know, he, he for someone who, you know, supposedly demands so much loyalty, I mean, he is the most disloyal person, you know, I've ever seen. I mean, and he was that way in private business, from what I understand. Well, you, you know, know I, my, I mean, I, I, you, know, you, know. I, I, you know, I've been in a position where I've been kind of a boss in that I, I would do a radio show and I had a whole staff of people that were backup people on the show. And I always told everybody, if you ever think I'm doing something wrong or I'm, I did something wrong... Stand up and tell me, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want a bunch of yes men around here. He does. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go up against him. You don't want to have him feel you're being disagreeable. Because mm -hmm. he will then have it out for you. Yeah. Uh, the perfect example of this is Fox News did a poll to see how the Democratic candidates stack up against Trump. Five of them beat Trump in a matchup, mm -hmm. okay? Buttigieg being one of them. Uh, he then has White House pollsters that they hired to go out <laughs> and do the same thing. And the results come back, and guess what? It's the same result, <laughs> yeah. okay? So what does he do? He doesn't like the news, so he shoots the messenger and gets rid yeah. of the pollsters. Mm -hmm. You just paid, what, a couple of million bucks to get polls done, and now you're going to say they're wrong? Especially when they also agree with Fox, who would like to have it on your side, but it isn't, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean it, Biden, it's, beats it's him, Biden beats him by about 10 points. Yeah. And, and Buttigieg, and, and, and I think, beats states. him by about, by, by about five points. Or maybe two yeah. points, something like that. I and, and it's and it's only going to take one or two of those states to swing the election back away from yeah. him. I mean it, it. I mean you know that's. I mean I know he says he you know won in the biggest landslide victory since you know George fucking Washington. But I mean, okay, we all know well, the, the Washington that. Washington I mean, lose the true. Washington lose by three million. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <probably> not. <laughs> yeah. <You know. clears throat> So, I mean, you know, I mean, so it's only going to take one or two of those states anyway, but, and this is a long way to go. We've talked about all that. I mean, so I understand, and I know everyone's going to say, well, you know, the polls get it wrong. I agree with all that, but I'm just saying that's why he's so upset because the polling at this time, if you break it down, indicates that not only would he lose, but he's going to get, you know, he's going to get a whooping. I mean, you know, I mean, it, well, it's going to be like when Bill Clinton got reelected over Bob Dole. It's going to be that kind of a victory. Okay, but it, here's or, the here's the big question. The here's the big question. It was hitting me tonight. I I said to myself, uh, you know, it looks to me like uh, like uh, uh, Trump is quite beatable. Okay, I mean, if the 
polls at this point say that. We aren't even into the real down and out arguing. And all these people in America have already heard what Trump has to say, but they all, all haven't heard what Biden has to say and what Buttigieg has to say and what Elizabeth Warren has to say. So that distance could even get larger if you get the best, yep. if you had a really good candidate, okay? So Trump is beatable. But I think the only thing that's working in his favor is the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who, given yeah. the chance, mm -hmm. will fuck up and nominate the wrong person. I agree. And, and, and the only other thing that I was going to mention when you got done, and, and possibly, you know, he better <clears throat> pray that for the next, you know, 18, 19, 20 months, the economy stays where it's at. Because if it begins to tick down at all, you know, that's going to pull the rug right out from under his... I mean, that, that's going to be his last argument. When things don't start looking good, when he's in the general election, and he's facing the other party's nominee, and it gets in the heat, if the economy starts to not do well at all, I think, you know, that, that'd be the worst possible thing that could happen to him, in my opinion. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. because, I mean, he's, he's, he's not going to have anything to fall back on at that point. Yes, Jim, uh, Jeff had his hand up. Jeff? Yeah, I'm curious. Who do we think is the Democrat that that might get this job or who won't get this job? You know, well, even if they... My fear is, you know, my, my fear is is that the Democrats will nominate the, you know, the, the public, the, the Democratic... Uh, <clears throat> Populists will go with the wrong candidate. Yeah, I I don't know that Biden's going to get the nomination, and and I I don't know that he's the guy to beat Trump, even though it looks like it now. I think, I quite frankly, you know my my instincts, my showbiz instincts, and that's really what this is all about. It is a giant game of show business. My showbiz instincts say that given if he's made the nominee and he has to go out there and and do be be a politician and you know convince people of his uh, his way and make people feel comfortable with him i think uh, mayor pete is a very good person to beat trump because he has there's a blank slate there i've talked about this before the trouble with biden is you've got 40 years of him making mistakes that you can go back to and you know and, and fight about and, and, and uh, to hold against him and whatever. In the meantime, this guy, Mayor Pete, what do you know about him? Oh, you know, he's a good-looking guy. He speaks very well. I mean, when I hear him talk about international stuff especially, he's so bright and he's so smart that I think this is the guy that could beat Trump because Trump can't really sully him. There's nothing for Trump to go after there except call him that fairy, and he won't do that because he knows that's a killer. Yes, uh, yes, Tom. Well, I'd say one of the things I really like about Buttigieg yeah. is he really articulates his yes. values very well. Like, one of the criticisms about him is that he doesn't have all these positions all all lined up like like Elizabeth Warren. I like Elizabeth Warren too, don't get me wrong. But one thing that you have to think of, no matter who gets elected, no matter how many wonderful, brilliant ideas they got, they've got to get those ideas through Congress. Mm -hmm. So 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 having having all these plans is very nice. Mm -hmm. But be able to, 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 to sell those plans to Congress mm -hmm. is, takes a lot of skill in itself. I, I think that's one of the things I liked about Buttigieg. Yeah, I think, that he, I think that he articulates his feelings well. He also has a gr great, a terrific grasp on international politics, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and he has a certain dignity that I think yes. almost every one of the other people lacks. I mean, I think Elizabeth Warren, is she's very bright. I think she's pretty good. I don't think she could win, okay? I'm thinking in showbiz terms. Who could win? What do you think, Patrick? Uh, I, 
I mean, Mayor Pete seemed to be the only one so far, mm -hmm. but it's so damn early. Yeah. To really, for, for me, I mean, we're going to have two debates coming up. Is it this week or next week? Next week, next yeah. And the, the thing that, now I know they did a, um, uh, it was a raffle or whatever, to see which of the five front runners would be where. And it, it kind of sucked the way it turned out, where it's just Elizabeth Warren on the first night, and then it's the four other ones on the second night. So there, Bernie and um, Biden and Kamala and Pete are going to be battling it out among themselves on one night. And Elizabeth Warren is going to have the stage pretty much to herself the first night with all the second tier people. And, you know, that I don't know if that's an advantage for her or not. And, you know, unfortunately for me, I would be more interested in watching the second night with the four on there battling each other than her all by herself. Okay, you're going to have side by side, you're going to have Buttigieg, Bernie, and Biden. The three Bs, if you will. Uh, they're going to be standing next to each other, which means they're going to be playing to each other. Okay? They're not going to be playing to de Blasio, who's all the way down at the end. Okay? And they have to crane their neck to see him. Um, well, you have to crane your neck to figure out his politics, too. But, you know, uh, but uh, in that triumvirate there, those three, that threesome, who do you think would hold up best in, at the end of the night? Bernie, yeah. Biden, or Buttigieg? Yes, Jeff. I think it's uh, Pete. Yeah. At this point. But it depends upon what they have to say. It also depends on what questions they're asked and how much time. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing that Elizabeth Warren may have the advantage on the first night is she got a big mouth and she's known. And these other people are, in everybody's view, also rammed already because it's Elizabeth Warren. And then on the second night, you do have the three or four bigger names, but they're going to have less time because, as you said, they're going to be playing off each other, yeah. but it's only two hours. And what questions are they going to get? And how much time are they going to have to answer? Mm -hmm. While Elizabeth may be given quite a wide berth on the first night to answer questions and to state her policies. So, you know, as much as it was supposed to be a, uh, a raffle, uh, you know, blind, whatever, it, uh, I think it should have been divided up a little better. You know, mm -hmm. two of them on one night, three on the other, or whatever, you know, of the bigger names. Because I don't know that you're going to get a real good litmus test from either one of those debates because of the way it got <coughs> divided. How, uh, Jeff, Jeff has his hand up. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, I think Warren is going to do very well uh, because I think she's a good speaker and she's 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 willing to talk to anybody and go after the details. She's she's okay. not so much a bullshitter. I, 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 I'm going to say something here that's probably going to drive Tom up a tree, uh, and that is that I always look at these things and I say, okay, I can tell you who I like. I can tell you who appeals to me, but mm. who can win? You know, who, and it's, and face it, ever since, uh, every election throughout history has been won based upon the media or the, the platform of the times. I, I use as an example the fact that FDR was the perfect radio president because he sounded good, but you didn't want to have to see him because he was always sitting down. You know, there was something suspicious about that. But radio, he was the walking, talking president, right? 
Uh, Lincoln. Don't say Walker. Lincoln was an imposing figure who looked great from the back of a train. All right? And then we get to television, and who do we suddenly see wins because of television? Kennedy. And so what we really realize, it's whatever the cosmetics of the day that are, are very, very electable. Uh, and um, I just wonder uh, if Elizabeth Warren just doesn't have the telefriendly look. You know what I'm saying? In other words, I like her thoughts and I can listen to them. And I, 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 under normal conditions, I would probably vote for her. But I don't think she can beat Trump. Yes, Patrick? I think if she looked like Tristan Hillebrand mm -hmm. and had her, you know, and it was Elizabeth Warren, I think that would be a, a better combination for her for television. Yeah, well, I mean, who's, who's that really, who's that sexy one that people mentioned the other day? Huh? Tulsi. Huh? Gabbard. It's also Gabbard. She's what from Hawaii? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there's Yeah, yeah. I saw a picture of her the other day. She's very attractive. Yes, Tom. Well, I'll just say just to answer what you're saying, I'm willing to let the trust in the process, you know, because for all its flails, that's what we've got. You know, that's the process. And let's go ahead and see let the voters decide. Who's going to be the candidate? And but, but, but as we, I said, I, I don't see why it was with war or can't win. But you see, we live in a very mediaized age, though, Tom. You well, know? Well, uh, and, and, and it, you're not... You, it's that's, different than it was when, when Kennedy was running. Television has changed as well. You know, we're, we're beyond the, the days when we just had the three networks. Yeah. We've got the multiplicity of networks, and we've also got social media. So we're we're dealing with a different age, and I'm not saying I, 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 I know I I don't know what how this will play out, but I just I just say, <coughs> voters decide who the, the the best Democratic candidate is, with. and I'll say one thing right now, whoever that nominee is go, nominee is going to be, I am going to do go out and work for that nominee and do everything I can to get that person elected. Yes, sir. yes, Patrick. Yeah, Tom, you need to scream now to all of your friends on Facebook because I, I think that you and I have some common friends that are, and I, I don't know if you heard me say this a few times over the last... I've heard you say it a few times, and I'll, I'll tell you this, Patrick. I'm sorry to interrupt you. If you I want you to tell your family, since we are Facebook friends... You go back and tell your family, if they do not vote for the Democratic nominee, they are voting for Donald Trump. Yep. They are voting for Donald Trump. You can tell your Bernie friends, if you know, if they don't vote for the Democratic nominee, they're voting yeah, for but Donald Trump. Tom, Tom, you actually had Democrats who didn't get their nominee last time, okay, because they wanted Bernie. And when they didn't get Bernie, guess who they voted for? Trump. Stein. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, or Trump. Yeah. And which means they really voted for Donald Trump. No, they voted for Donald Trump. They, I'm, I don't. Bernie didn't get nominated, therefore I'm voting for Donald Trump. What? How do Only you? How do you make sense? of the Bernie voters did not vote for Hillary. Only ten percent. That's a smaller percentage of the Hillary voters that didn't vote for Obama. Okay. Yeah, but I still think I, I still think I still think I, I I worry about Democrats. Okay, they do not play a good long game. Okay, well we we, we, we got to go out and educate them. That's the thing. We well, do have to but see, but but I I agree with you on that. But uh, I've kept quiet because what I'm going to have to say, and Patrick is going to know what I'm going to say because I've talked to him before. He's just going to make everybody lose their fucking minds. But. <laughs> I mean, you're right that they don't, but I think, but I don't think that they don't do it in the way that you guys do. I mean, I see a person like Joe Biden as the only true person in that group that can be the nominee, and I see him as the only person that not only can defeat Donald Trump, but as the only person who, after that fact, can actually govern. I mean, 
you know, and I've, and I've told people, I've, my wife knows, I mean, I've talked to her before, if they want to go down this route with their latest fling, you know, this fucking Mayor Pete, I'm not voting for this fucking Mayor Pete. And I'm not voting for Donald Trump. If I have to write in Chairman fucking Mao, that's what I'll do, but I'm not voting for Mayor Pete. I don't want another fucking flash in the pan, 37-year-old mayor from some bumfuck goddamn town in fucking Indiana. I, I want someone from Washington who can fucking take care of business. A battle-hardened goddamn fucking warrior who knows how to get things done. And this, this fucking guy, I mean, he, he's just, he reminds me of the guy that runs our plant. You know, he's 35 fucking years old. He's going to micromanage everybody right down to the T because he's got all the fucking answers. And then you got Elizabeth Warren, who he'll tear to fucking shreds. Kamala Harris, who's no one's fucking heard of from around here. No one fucking cares to hear of from around here. Bernie Sanders, you know, who 99.9% of, of the people that I live are like, oh my God, is he still running for president? I mean, we went down that road once. He looks like a fucking lunatic. I mean, I, I'm just giving you what people think. I'm not saying I feel this exact way about all these people, but... We have to win a general election, and then after the general election, we have to make America have some progress and maintain power for long enough, not to be greedy about it, but maintain power long enough to continually implant an agenda the way the Republican Party has done for the last two or three decades, and that is the one area that they've mastered that this, that this party cannot seem to ever understand. I mean... I've been a supporter of Biden's for a long time, and I've said before that in a general election, he will bring Trump's rhetoric, but he will do it with integrity, not with the shameful acts that, you know, Trump puts into the mix, where he just acts like a completely classless individual. I mean, Joe Biden will box within the rules of the game, and, and he can make it work. Now, but I don't see these other people as electable. When I know he, nobody likes to hear it, but, but I mean, yeah. I just, that's the way I, I look at it. When you get a chance, uh, I'd like you to go look at uh, the front of uh, Drudge tonight, because uh, I would show it to you only if I put it up, you can't see it, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. But it is a picture of the Orlando Stadium, which holds about, what, 20,000 people, was it? Something like that? Completely well, packed, that. like it's... Uh, you know, who's that reverend that's on TV on Sundays uh, who has his mega church? It looks like that. Uh, and it, it, the headline, of course, from Drudge is MAGA Mega Orlando, Trump stages greatest show yet. That's what it's become. Now, I, you know, those 20,000 people could all vote for Trump and that ain't going to get them elected. Uh, but. Nevertheless, that's what we're going to have to put up with in this campaign. It is going to become a big show. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tom. Well, just to answer, Josh, and I'll just say to you, Josh, what I just said to Patrick, especially you're in Ohio, you're in a swing state. If you don't vote for the Democratic nominee, you are voting for Trump. And just recognize that, okay? Uh, I'm fully aware of that. that. I mean, I mean <laughs> that's fine. Okay. That, that means you're perfectly fine with the, losing the Supreme Court for the next <clears throat> several years. Next four decades. Yeah, because the next president is going to be choosing one, maybe probably two Supreme Court justices. So we've lost the Supreme Court. So if you support unions, Forget the unions. If you support the environment, no, no, no. Look, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be attacked with the continual liberal line that I have to go down that road and conform to everything they believe in. Because I'm just telling you, there are a lot of things that I believe in that the Democratic Party is getting away from, and people in my area are getting away from. And I am one of those Democratic voters that was left behind in the last cycle. And, and didn't vote for Trump because I don't believe in, in, in that far on the other end of the spectrum. But they've got to get back to talking to some people like myself. You know, some, and, and I'm just telling you, the Mayor Pete thing is just going to evolve into a bunch of horse shit about who goes to the bath. I, I can tell you where they're going to take it. Who goes to the bathroom where and all this gender identity. I mean, the, 
they're going to forget. Yeah. Do I support unions? Yes. And I support a Democratic nominee who's going to actually be able to do something for them instead of getting himself torn to shreds so that he can't get elected, in which case nothing will get done for them. I'm going to preempt it by saying if you, as a party, nominate someone who cannot defeat Trump, you all voted for Trump. I mean, you know, I'm just I'm not going to be led down the liberal road of, you know, well, if you don't vote for our nominee and you don't do the things that we do, then, you know, you're, you're, you're not with us. You're, you're part of the problem. Well, there are some middle Americans. There are some middle-aged white Americans who have a little bit of education and who sweat at work and take a shower when they get home who are sick and tired of being lectured to by the left. And that's exactly what oh, we got oh, last it, time, it, and that's exactly what we're getting this time. Let me... So, so, you, thought, excuse me, so, so you thought that uh, nominating Hillary Clinton uh, were being lectured by the left? No, I thought that Hillary Clinton would have been the nominee with a lot more support and defeated Donald Trump if we hadn't had such a, a divided season beforehand between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. I mean, the left has got this, it's the same symptoms that the right suffered from, you know, a few decades ago. They just haven't found their way yet. I mean, there's still this split within this party of people like myself and probably people like yourself and that's that's okay they're allowed to have their own you know ideas and agenda on where the party goes i'm just saying you know if i sit here on my tv and i say i don't like trump everybody knows that and this mayor pete guy shows up and i have my own reasons for saying nope nope and nope and if he is the nominee and i don't want to vote for either one of them nobody is going to tell me why that's wrong I can vote for anybody that I want to vote for. Well, you know something? I, I agree with you to that extent, uh, Josh, that uh, to say that uh, if, if, you, if you don't vote, you know, that, that, you, um, uh, that you're, you're voting for Trump. And I, I you know, my, there's part of me that says not voting should be a vote in and of itself. You know, like none of these people appeal to me. And you don't have that. I wish that on the ballot we had none of the above. And if none of the above won, we'd have to hold the election again. Yeah. You know? I've actually voted for that. They had it on this, the California ballot of none of the above, and it lost. So, oh. But, but I, that's the, that the reality, this is what we've got. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll just say it, I'll say it's clear. People who, who really take it that not the party of the Democratic mm -hmm. nominee are are not really, you know, you're, you're, one part you're saying how dangerous yeah. this man is in, in Washington, and that you want to go ahead and allow him the, the, the possibility of another four years? Yeah. Now listen, I, let me, let me, let me I go. Mean, we are at the brink. Yeah. We're, once let, again, me, let me go to, pa let me go to, war let, me, with Iran. let me go to Patrick quickly because he had his hand up and then we'll make him the final yeah. word on the whole thing. Well, uh, the, uh, the vote of, none of the above is the write-in candidate. And that's what I'll probably do this election time, because I won't be voting for Trump. There won't be another Republican that could beat him. I mean, we know that. Even if uh, Pence went up against him, there, there aren't enough Republicans that would support Pence to go against him. But I'm going to write it. Yeah. Hey, listen, there, there is our theme song. Wow. It's been nice tonight. It's been good. Good, solid discussion, uh, and I, I, I love all of you. Uh, but, but let me just, uh, first of all, thank uh, the following people. Josh, thank you so much tonight. Tom, glad to hear from you. By the way, it's a feel-free night again tomorrow night if you're interested. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Charlie Wallace. Always a pleasure having you here. Why don't you all give a big wave goodbye, and I'll wave back, okay? There they go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Uh, and I'm going to close off the Skype lines here so the next program can use it, which is, of course, the intersection with Jack Bishop, who can be heard over most of this same GabNet station uh, with the intersection. So be sure to stick around for him and call him. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow night. First of all, we have the franchise MC. He does a, a sports show called The Arena. Then it's Damian Chaplin with his brand new computer. And then I'll be back again 
tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her to please close the window so I don't have to put up with the pollen and tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>